Thank you for coming this morning. We're going to be looking at a lot of the quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy today. And we're going to be relating those to some of the evidences that we've been talking about earlier this weekend. But the first one I want to talk to you about is found in Spiritual Gifts, actually. Volume 3, page 84. Where it says, Those who lived before the flood come forth with their giant-like stature, more than twice as tall as men now living on the earth, and well-proportioned. Now remember last night we talked about an article that was in Life magazine talking about the oldest bones arriving, from, arriving in the U.S. from Africa. And in this article, it actually showed, this was uh, from Life magazine, October 7, 1946, actually showed uh, some very interesting photographs in another one, Life Magazine, March 21, 1949. There are very few fossil remains of giants that lived before the flood. And we're not really sure why God in His providence has not suffered more evidences of the giants to be found than has been found. But we feel that perhaps these photos that were taken in Life Magazine or published in Life Magazine, and these are drawings, representations of those photographs, show that there is fossil evidence, little fossil evidence of giants that used to live before the flood. And in fact, here's a man holding a piece of that jawbone, and he called it Meganthropus or Meganthropus a gigantic man who supposedly lived in Java between 450,000 and 550,000 years ago. We'd like to dispute that and say perhaps this and perhaps this molar tooth, a drawing of which is shown here, is actually from one of the antediluvians. Now this is of course a drawing. The actual photograph I'd like to emphasize is found in the Life magazine that uh, we spoke of earlier. And then again, you see representations here of the African giant compared to modern man. And you compare that with the statement that we found in Ellen White that the giants, more than twice as tall as men living today, will come forth. And we will be able to see at that time exactly how tall they once were. But one of the most controversial statements, again, like we read yesterday, is found in Early Writings, page 41, where, and she only mentions this actually once in her writings, but she does say in this uh, quotation, dark heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. Now, as modern astronomy has advanced, uh, development of the Hubble Space Telescope, we've been getting a more and more clear picture of exactly what is in Orion, the Orion Nebula. And in fact, when you look at a three-dimensional representation of Orion, you can actually see that there is a sort of bowl-like configuration. And it's in this bowl-like configuration that we're theorizing, hypothesizing, is found the open space of which Ellen White was talking about. In the center of this bowl, from an astronomical standpoint, is the clustered star cluster of the trapezium. And we're going to be looking at, actually, the trapezium in much greater detail as we go through an animation sequence. And we see closer and closer where we are to the trapezium star cluster here. Closer still. And here's the three-dimensional representation of the Orion Nebula, which we saw yesterday. This was a computer-generated animation taken or generated from various photographs of the Orion Nebula, which show the characteristic bowl shape that I was trying to describe earlier. We want to actually look at what um, the Spirit of Prophecy has to say about some of the astronomical findings. And in fact, 
In Patriarchs and Prophets on page 50, it says, they, or Adam and Eve, were visited by angels and were granted communion with their maker with no obscuring veil between the mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge, and afforded them an exhaustless source of instruction and delight. The visible universe is what we want to key, uh, have our key focus on here. We believe that the first parents, Adam and Eve, actually had more, of a visi had more visibility of the um, stars and star systems than we have now, and perhaps could even rival what the, what the Hubble Space Telescope could see. We're not really told exactly what they could see, but it wouldn't be surprising to me that they might have been able to see some of the same things that we're seeing with the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's the visible universe that was created for them, we believe, on day four of Creation Week. And we're going to look at some more quotes that support that. But here's a picture of Edwin Hubble, and it was through Edwin's Hubble, Edwin Hubble's discovery of the redshift relation and the various galaxies and the relationship of the galaxies to their, their particular redshift. An increasing distance was found to be associated and correlated with an increasing redshift. And that ultimately led to the development of the Hubble relation, which states that we live in an expanding universe. And as we look at the telescopes, through the telescopes, and we take time-lapse photographs of the galaxies and star systems, we can see the beauty of God's creation in that. We can see that even the secular astronomers are in awe of God's creation. Without a belief in God, they still have to come to a conclusion that something is out there which is making these beautiful star systems. Hubble Deep Field, again, pointing the Hubble Space Telescope at a point in space which has apparently no galaxies in it, apparently a dark space in the sky. But when the time-lapsed um, photography of the Hubble Space Telescope was trained on this one area of the sky, and the shutter was left open and reopened and reopened time after time. It goes to show exactly what's out there behind the veil, so to speak. Millions and literally billions of galaxies, unbefore, you know, never before seen, never even dreamed or imagined that they were visible. And here we see a model which has the galaxies represented as arrows radiating out from a central point. And the length of those arrows represent the speed of the galaxies. Um, and of course, the further galaxies out have the longer arrows representing a higher velocity. The galaxies closer having the shorter arrows represent, of course, a slower velocity. And we would like to emphasize that this relationship that Hubble found, the Hubble relation, the, the, the relationship between redshift and the distant galaxies, does indicate and can be used to support a view that we live in a spherically symmetric universe, that we live in a universe which has a center. And we have to Want to, so we want to support what we're saying, of course, not only through the Bible, but we want to look at the evidences in the spirit of prophecy. In the Bible, we see in Isaiah 40, verse 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Psalm 115, verse 3, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Psalm 103, 19, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. There's a very interesting quotation here that was actually
a dialogue, a conversation between W.A. Spicer and John Harvey Kellogg. The question was asked by Dr. Kellogg to Spicer, and Kellogg says, where is God? And of course, this is being, re this is being remembered by W.A. Spicer. So W.A. Spicer is saying, Kellogg asked me, where is God? I was asked. I would naturally say, or Spicer would say, he is in heaven. There the Bible pictures the throne of God, all the heavenly beings at his command as messengers between heaven and earth. But I was told by Kellogg that God was in the grass and plants and in the trees. Now, Spicer continues, remembering his dialogue with uh, Dr. Kellogg. Dr. Kellogg said, where is heaven? I was asked, or Spicer was asked. Spicer says, I had my idea of the center of the universe with heaven and the throne of God in the midst, but disclaimed any attempt to fix the center of the universe astronomically. But I was urged to understand that the heaven is where God is, and God is everywhere. He's in the grass, in the trees, in all creation. There was no place in this scheme of things for angels going between heaven and earth, for heaven was here and everywhere. The cleansing of the sanctuary that we taught about was not something in a faraway heaven. The sin is here, Dr. Kellogg said. The sin is here, pointing to his heart. And here is the sanctuary to be cleansed. Now, I'd like to point out here that Ellen White later identified this as the Alpha of the Apostasy. And it was a direct attack on the sanctuary doctrine. When you remove the sanctuary out of heaven and you place it now in the earth, in our own hearts, everywhere, she said directly, meet it. Meet the crisis. In essence, confront it. And why do we talk about the sanctuary? Why do we bring this um, up between W.A. Spicer and Dr. Kellogg? Well, for, for two reasons. One, we want to show that there was somebody else in the early Adventist movement that actually saw or believed in the idea that God's throne did represent, in a sense, the midst of the universe, the center of the universe, that the universe has a center. And it's true that W.A. Spicer did not try to affix astronomically where that center of the universe is. But he did believe in a center of the universe. So I think that um, to hear somebody else now today say, you know, consider that the universe has a center. Take Hubble's data, take the redshift data, and use that as a springboard to say that, you know, perhaps the universe is spherically symmetric. It's something to think about. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now, of things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. We'd like to submit to you today that this true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and, and not man, was the original tabernacle of which the pattern was made by the ancient Israelites as they were going through the wilderness. God gave them a template, not of something that He just made up, but of their true tabernacle, which was in heaven, the true temple. And the sanctuary, of course, the real sanctuary is in heaven not in our hearts, not everywhere, not, not in the grass and not in the trees. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way opened for us through the curtain that is His body. Again, Jesus entering the most holy place in heaven. There is a sanctuary, a true tabernacle. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. We have such an high priest a minister of the true tabernacle. Now there's an interesting quote here. It's from Great Controversy. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. 
Unfettered by mortality, they winged their tireless flights to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe, and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and wisdom of unfallen beings. Now here we come to the part which I want to emphasize. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems. Perhaps by the word systems, she's actually referring to galaxies here. We're, we're not sure, but perhaps. Suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order. What? Circling the throne of deity. Very interesting, huh? This isn't some obscure reference here, right? This is great controversy. Right in the middle of great, well, right at the end of great controversy, she says, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of His power displayed. Now, I think everybody here today can say, after looking at the pictures of the galaxies on the Hubble Space Telescope, that certainly the riches of God's power are evident when you look at those pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. I know that I can certainly say myself, I was just looking at them this morning and thinking to myself, you know, wow, we're sort of numbed a little bit by, see yeah, we see these pictures of the galaxies and we just say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But just stop and think about it sometime, what you're looking at. These are, some, these are some of the evidences of creation which God has left for us to encourage us. Now, secular science has taken those and they have dismissed them as nothing more than just the product of evolution. But I think that we have something greater to look for than just a belief that these are just chance occurrences, chance galaxies, spiritual gifts. Between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah will come the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. Interesting. Between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah. How about between the beliefs of men, between the cherished beliefs of men, the beliefs of men in evolution, the beliefs of men in the authority of science over God, the authority of science over the Bible, will come the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. Upon this battle we are now entering, a battle not between rival churches contending for the supremacy, but between the religion of the Bible and the religions of fable and tradition. The agencies which have united against truth are now actively at work. God's holy word, which is handed down to us at so great a cost of suffering and bloodshed, is little valued. There are few who really accept it as the rule of life. Infidelity prevails to an alarming extent, not, only in, the not in the world only, but in the church. Many have come to deny doctrines which are the very pillars of the Christian faith, the great facts of creation as presented by the inspired writers, the fall of man, the atonement. All of these are called into question. And of course, I think we can all see that today there are many, even within our own church, who call into question some of these great truths that we know to be true. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 91 says, but the infidel supposition that the events of the first week required seven vast indefinite periods for their accomplishment strikes directly at the foundation of the fourth commandment strikes directly at the foundation of the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. It is the worst kind of infidelity. For with many who profess to believe the record of creation, it is infidelity in disguise. So we have to be careful when we hear people say, yes, 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 I believe in creation, I believe in the Bible, but yet on the other hand, call into question the very things that the Bible says. You can't on the one hand say, I believe in the Bible, I believe in creation, but on the other side of your mouth say, you know, we really have a problem with um, some of the evidences that we see in science. And I've heard this. People say, you know, there's, uh, there's problems here, there's problems there, there's questions here, there's questions there that we just don't have the answers to. 
So we shouldn't be arrogant to these people that come to us who believe in evolution and say that we have the truth and we know creation is true. We shouldn't be so arrogant with those people. We have to admit to them, hey, we see your point. We, we understand that there's evidences there for an ancient earth that we just can't understand and we can't explain it. You see, once you give that ground up, once you come to them and say, hey, we're with you, man. We understand, you know, we've got problems. They're like, yeah, you do. We're right and you're wrong. You see, when you partly cling to the Bible and partly cling to science, you fall between the center of the chairs. It's like sit, trying to sit in two chairs. If you try to sit on two opinions, what ends up happening? You end up with no opinion. You end up falling between the crack. You can't have two opinions about something which is black and white. It doesn't work. As much as you can try, it's impossible. But basically, the infidel geologists are at a loss to account for a creation week which only has seven literal days. And let me just uh, advance this so you can see what I'm talking about. Infidel geologists are at a loss to understand. Well, they, they reject the Bible record, okay? It says there that they reject the Bible record. They're at a loss to account for the wonderful things they see in the earth. As long as they hold on to the view that the earth is only, was created in seven literal days and the earth world is now only about 6,000 years old. In other words, when they go out into the field and they see the evidences and they look at the um, scientific evidence, they can't understand how this evidence fits with a model of the universe that has the earth being created in six days and that the earth is only 6,000 years old. So what do they do with it? They throw it away. They throw it away and they say the earth is not 6,000 years old. The earth is billions of years old. They say that the earth was not created in six literal days, but it was created billions of years ago. And then later, you know, God came by and sort of refurbished it. So I think we need to just really be careful with how, you know, consistent we are in our beliefs. If we're going to be evolutionist, let's be evolutionist, right? But if we're going to be creationist, Let's really be creationist. Let's really believe in God. Let's, let's set ourselves apart from the world. If we try to hang on a little bit to the world and believe a little bit of what they're telling us, we end up losing everything. We certainly don't gain their respect, right? Because we come to the evolutionary camp with our little bag of beliefs and we're saying, hello, can we come join you? We have this belief in Jesus and God, and we, but we'll believe in evolution with you. They're like, we don't want you. We're atheists. We don't even believe in God. Or perhaps maybe, you know, there is theistic evolution. But the thing is, is that no matter what, we want to stand on the truth. It doesn't matter what else is out there. If we stand on the truth, we're safe. The great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close. We bring this up because Many, many times in the spirit of prophecy, this one's in Great Controversy, page 518, Ellen White refers to the length of the Great Controversy lasting 6,000 years, nearly 6,000 years, for over 6,000 years, 6,000 years, over and over and over again, 6,000 years, 6,000 years. If we believe that Ellen White was inspired, which we do historically as Seventh-day Adventist, we are left with the conclusion that the earth the Great Controversy is about 6,000 years old. This is actually in harmony with what many people obtain from the study of biblical chronology. Volume 8 of the Testimonies. The work of creation can never be explained by science. The theory that God did not create matter when He brought the world into existence is without foundation. There's a little pun there, right? Um, in the formation of our world, God was not indebted to pre-existing matter. On the contrary, all things, material or spiritual, stood up before the Lord Jehovah at His voice and were created for His own purpose. The heavens and all the host of them, the, ho the earth and all things therein, are not only the work of His hand, they came into existence by the breath of His mouth. Now, I would like to submit to you that when she says that the theory, you know, that God was not indebted to to pre-existing matter when he formed this world, that it literally means just that, that God, through the breath of his mouth, through the power that is inherent in his voice, actually spoke matter into existence. 
when He called the earth into existence. I believe on day one of creation week. And I don't believe He used pre-existing matter. And I understand Genesis 1, verse 2. It says, "...and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the earth was without form and void." I understand all that. But I also understand that there's places in the Bible where it says, "...and the smoke of their torment ro uh, rose forever and ever." And the fire and the torment of their, you know, the flame ascent, you know, the, there's, there's verses in the Bible that you can take to mean that the, the, the wicked burn eternally in hell. So you can't take one verse in the Bible and then build a model of uh, beliefs around that one verse. Otherwise, we would believe in eternal hellfire. But we don't. The reason why we don't is because we take other verses in combination with those verses and we say, you know what? We're going to take all the verses that deal with hellfire and we're going to analyze each one of them and see is there some kind of common understanding that we can have with all of these verses. The same thing, the same principle needs to be applied to creation and the existence of a pre-existing earth. Yeah, people can take Genesis 1-2 and ride off onto the horse, ride off in their, on their horse into the sunset and say, this proves that the earth was pre, you know, there was a pre-existing earth. This proves it. It proves it. No, it doesn't prove it. It doesn't prove it. That's my point, you know? Now, we can't stop people from believing that, but it doesn't prove it. Any more than the smoke of their torment riseth forever and ever proves that the wicked are burning in hell forever, right? We don't believe that. So let's be consistent in um, how we approach um, Bible study. We're not going to take one verse and make a theology out of it. But the what God wrote with His own finger is a good place to start in Exodus 20 where He says, but in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. Great controversy. Page 455. When the foundation of the earth was laid, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, there was laid the foundation of the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath had no meaning, had no existence prior to the formation of this earth. If the earth was existing for billions of years with no, with no Sabbath, is that true? No. The, the, the Sabbath was made when the earth was created. And there the foundation of the Sabbath was laid when the earth was created. When the foundations of the earth were laid, when the morning stars sang together and shouted for joy. So the earth and the Sabbath foundations are linked. You have on day one, you have day two, day three. Each day of creation has something specifically that was created. And on day seven, the first Sabbath. It's all linked together. As we said, the Exodus 20, verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. The Lord blessed the seventh day and He hallowed it. It's the basis of our belief in the Sabbath. It's the basis of our belief in worshiping on the seventh day. Testimonies, Volume 2. He set apart that special day for man to rest from his labor. That as what? As he should look upon the earth beneath, look down, and upon the heavens above, up to the stars, he might reflect that God made some of these in six days, right? No, that God made all of these in six days and rested the seventh and that as he should behold the tangible proofs of God's infinite wisdom, his heart might be filled with love and reverence for his Maker. You know, many people look at the um, fourth day of creation, and, you know, the Bible talks about that God created two great lights, the lesser light to rule the night, the greater light to rule the day, the sun and the moon. And then it says he made the stars also. Well, I've heard many people ridicule that, that uh, you know, that phrase to death and say, well, <laughs> there's no way, you know, God... You know, the Bible says that He made the stars there, but that, that, that can't really possibly be true. He couldn't have done all that on just the fourth day. Why would, he have, why would He have created all the stars on the fourth day? You know, that doesn't make any sense. And so I've heard that explained away many, many, many times. But what this is saying is, is that, you know what, it's actually okay to believe that the stars were made on, during creation week. Because it says here that as man should look to the earth beneath and at the heavens above. In other words, as man looks to the heavens above, he can reflect that God made all these in six days. So Ellen White actually supports a literal interpretation of the Bible where, you know, she's going to say, hey, it's okay to believe that God created the stars on the fourth day. You know, he's actually 
powerful enough to do that. But I've heard people say, no, no, can't happen, can't. And I say, why? And they're like, hmm, um, the light wouldn't have had time to get here. And I'm like, oh, okay, the light wouldn't have, oh, okay, so God couldn't have done it because he, the light couldn't have gotten here. And they're like, yep, yep, would have taken millions of years for the light to have even gotten to the earth. So there's no way that God could have created those stars on day four because the light wouldn't even reach the earth before the end of creation week. There's no way. So I've heard all the excuses. I've heard all the reasons. I've heard everything about how God is not powerful enough to do what the Bible says that it did. And now you have Ellen White. She's confused now too, obviously, because now she's saying, hey, you can look at the heavens above and you can reflect that God made all these in six days. I'm just, I'm just saying, let's open our minds a little bit to the power of God. God calls men to look up into the heavens, see Him in the wonders of the starry heavens. We are not merely to gaze upon the heavens, we are to consider the works of God. So when you look at the heavens, you're not supposed to just look up there and just think nothing, you're supposed to think that is the power of God. That is the creative power of God. We are to study His works of, we, He would have us, God would have us to study His works, the works of infinity, and from this study, learn to love and reverence and obey Him. Isn't that interesting? We can actually learn to love and reverence and obey God by the study of astronomy. That's interesting to me. The heavens and the earth with their treasures are to do what? Teach us the lessons of God's love, care, and power. So there's actually some benefit to our own souls in studying astronomy, studying the works of creation. Advent Review. Through the fourth commandment, the attention of men is called to the power of the infinite hand that placed the stars in the firmament. Wait a minute, what does that say? The power of the infinite hand that placed the stars in the firmament. If they had obeyed this commandment, they would have worshiped God as they looked at the sun that rules the day and the moon which rules the night. Behold, the glories of the firmament, from High Calling, page 193. Look up to the gems of light, which like precious gold stud the heavens. Now this is kind of an interesting thought. Cannot He, who is He? It's God. Cannot God, who spread above us this glorious canopy, who, if the sun, moon, and stars, okay? That sounds like everything to me. Sun, moon, and stars were swept away, all right, swept away, what does that mean? Gone, right, gone. Could call them again into existence in a moment. Now, what does that mean? It means if he could call them again into existence in a moment, what happened the first time? He called them into existence in a moment the first time, right? So in the, if God called them into existence in a moment the first time, He could do it again if they were all swept away and call them in, all into existence in a, again. I mean, we have evidences from the spirit of prophecy if we don't believe the Bible. We have evidences from the spirit of prophecy that very clearly and specifically state that the heavens above us are the works of God that God created during creation. And if he, he can call them into existence just as quickly as He called them into existence at the beginning. Isaiah 42, 5. Thus saith God the Lord, that he, he that created the heavens and stretched them out. Isaiah 45, 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. The Son of God hath wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven. And to Him, as well as to, their, to God, their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. But in all this, He would not seek power or exaltation for Himself, contrary to God's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute His purposes of beneficence and love from Patriarchs and Prophets, very clearly stating that Jesus was involved directly in the creation of this world and of the heavens. Psalm 68, 33. To Him who rides on the heaven of heavens 
which were of old. To him who rides the ancient skies above, who thunders with mighty voice, Psalm 68, 33. Now, we just like to say those are the same verse in two different versions, but I just like to say this. Many people, particularly Seventh-day Adventists, come to us and say, you know what? You're wrong about um, God creating the universe on uh, fourth day. He didn't really create the stars. And I'm like, why? Because Ellen White specifically states that there were worlds in existence prior to creation. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, you're wrong. And I'm saying, okay, that's true. Ellen White very specifically talks about worlds that were in existence prior to this world, which means that there were things in existence prior to creation week. Now, does that negate the fact that God could have created the stars that we see on day four? No, I don't think so. What that means is, is that there were portions of the non-visible universe, right? Ellen White talks about Adam and Eve enjoying the visible universe. That's what we can see. I have a suggestion for you. There might be parts of the universe which are not visible to us. There might be parts of the universe which are not visible to even the Hubble Space Telescope. Now that's a shocker, isn't it? Because it seems like the Hubble Space Telescope, if it's out there, it can see it, right? But I don't think so. Because I think when we build an even more powerful telescope, it's going to see things the Hubble couldn't see. But then you're going to find that even the most powerful telescope, the best telescope that could ever be built, is never going to be able to see parts of the universe which, may have been in, which were probably in existence prior to Creation Week. And in fact, you get, a, you get a hint of that here in Psalm 68. There were parts of the heavens which were of old. Now what does that mean? Heaven of heavens, which were of old. That to me th uh, indicates that there were parts of the universe, parts of God's existence, which have existed for eternity. Now that part was not created during creation week, right? That's not part of our visible universe. So I'm okay with the fact that there were worlds in existence prior to this world. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't, they don't have to be part of this visible universe. You know what? They just don't have to be. So let's not force them into our universe if that's not where they are. You know, we don't, we're not given information on where they are. But the thing is, wherever they are, it doesn't negate God's power to call into existence what He has called into existence. So I'm not worried about the unfallen worlds. You know, okay, we're not worried about that. I'm not worried about how that keeps us from believing that God created the stars. Psalm 68, 32 and 33, Sing to God, O heavens, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord, to Him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Here's that kind of phraseology again. The ancient heavens. There's part of the heavens which may have exist, existed from eternity past. And we're okay with that. Okay, we're okay with that. The Bible talks about it. Ellen White alludes to it. It's good. Another version says, Sing to God, O kings and kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord, to Him who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times. Yes. Yes. Acts 7, 55, 56. But He, full of the Holy Spirit. Now who is He? Stephen. Gazed into the heaven and saw the glory of God and standing at the right hand of God. And He said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, that's very interesting. Adam and Eve could see, the vis could see the visible universe with their undimmed vision. Perhaps God actually worked a miracle here so that Stephen could see a vision of the invisible universe, the part of the universe which Adam and Eve really maybe did not see. And in this, I think, might be suggested by the fact that after becoming full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen through the Holy Spirit was actually given a vision or a view of heaven itself. He saw the gates from heaven opening. I don't think no matter how powerful a Hubble tel Space Telescope that we make, it's ever going to be able to see what Stephen saw. Because that was by the power of God that he was able to see that. It was a miracle. Mark 9, 2, 3, and 7. Jesus taking Peter, James, and John leadeth them up to a high mountain apart. Um, by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow. 
as no fuller on earth can white them. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear Him. Only three who are to witness His anguish in Gethsemane have been chosen to be with Him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now the burden of His prayer is that they be given a manifestation of the glory He had with the Father before the world was. His prayer is heard. While He, Jesus, is bowed in lowliness upon the stony ground, suddenly the heavens open, the golden gates of the city of God are thrown wide, and holy radiance descends upon the mount, enshrouding the Savior's form. Divinity from within flashes through humanity and meets the glory coming from above. Now, why do we emphasize that? It's because here is another miracle. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. Yet somehow, the radiance from the throne of God shines down and meets the radiance from Jesus coming up from beneath, from the earth. Now, I don't think that that holy radiance was limited to 186,000 miles per second. When God wants light to travel instantaneously, guess what happens? It's instant. There's no delay. And the light from Jesus meets the light coming from above, and the disciples witness it. That's why I'm saying we need to be careful saying, well, you know, God could not have created the stars on the um, fourth day of creation because the light could not have gotten here. You have, to, you have to look to yourself and say, look, when God commands something to happen, He's not bound by 186,000 miles per second. I mean, that's just the bottom line. We just have to back off and just say, you know what? I may not be able to measure speed of light at an infinite speed, but just because I haven't measured it, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have the power to move light at whatever speed He wants it to move at. So I think we just need to um, give that some thought. Early Writings, page 16, the 144,000 shouted, Alleluia, as they recognized their friends who had been torn from them by death. And in the same moment, we were changed and caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. We all entered the cloud together, and we were <clears throat> 186,000 years ascending to the sea of glass. 186,000 years? Because we were traveling at the speed of light. No, it doesn't say that. It says we, we were seven days ascending to the sea of glass. So whatever speed we're traveling at at that point, seven days, we have to be moving fairly rapidly. And I think that we're probably going to have some rest stops along the way, so that means that we're going to have to be traveling even more rapidly, you know, because we're going to have, maybe we'll, we'll stop along the way. I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I think that, you know, whatever needs to happen, whatever time frame Jesus wants to get us to heaven, if Jesus decided He wanted us to get us to heaven instantaneously, we could have, but, you know, seven days. I think we just need to, um, you know, realize that the power of God is capable, really, of anything. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 78 and 79, the holy inhabitants of other worlds were watching with the deepest interest the events taking place on the earth. Now that's interesting too. Somehow the signals or whatever, the information of what's happening here on earth is being transmitted instantaneously to these worlds afar, and people are watching. That's kind of a scary thought actually, isn't it? But anyway, it's true. I think it's true. In the condition of the world that existed before the flood, they saw the, the unfallen worlds, they saw illustrated the results of the administration which Lucifer had endeavored to establish in heaven in rejecting the authority of Christ and casting aside the law of God. So there you have it. Information, however that information is transmitted, is transmitted instantaneously to the worlds um, that were created prior to creation week. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 17, And I saw that when God said to His Son, Let us make man in our image, Satan was jealous of Jesus. He wished to have the highest place in heaven next to God and, received highest, and receive highest honors. Until this time, all heaven was in order, harmony and perfect subjection to the government of God. 
Story of Redemption, page 19, Then there was war in heaven. Angels in heaven mourned the fate of those who had been their companions in happiness and bliss. Their loss was felt in heaven. The Father consulted His Son in regard to at once carrying out their purpose to make man to inhabit the earth. Interesting. So what does that mean? What does that imply, possibly? When there was war in heaven, Satan was cast out. The Father consulted with Jesus in regard to, at once, carrying out their purpose to make man to inhabit the earth. So it sounds like to me that the revolt in heaven actually might have taken place during creation week. Perhaps maybe even on the sixth day of creation week. Because as soon as the revolt took place, as soon as the war broke out in heaven and they were um, thrown out, the Father said, let's make, let's make man at once to inhabit the earth which has been created. It's, it's an idea, okay? We don't need to uh, live and die on this idea, but it's just, it's, it's just an idea that perhaps um, we can draw from looking at this uh, quotation. But the reason I state this is because you have all these quotations in Ellen White saying that the great controversy has been happening for 6,000 years. She links the length of the great controversy to the same age as the earth. She speaks of them interchangeably. When did the great controversy begin? It began when Satan was cast out of heaven, right? When Satan was irrevocably expelled from heaven, the great controversy officially started. And that event sounds like very possibly happened simultaneous to the creation week, creation of the earth. Great Controversy, page 676. So many 6,000 year statements. I haven't brought up all the 6,000 year statements. But that's why I have a little bit of a problem when people say, well, we have good evidence that the earth is about 10,000 years old. Because the, and I say, why? And they say, well, the Egyptian papyra, um, really kind of force us into a position where we have to accept that the earth is at least 10,000 years old. The Egyptians made us do it. And I'm like, I don't care about the Egyptian papyra. The Egyptian papyra does not make me believe in a 10,000 year age of the earth. You know, so let's not make, let's not let the Egyptians um, force us off 6,000 years. Now the next thing that we're going to see is the animation, if everything goes right. The animation which shows um, the, the travel from earth to heaven. And in this animation, of course, is uh, pictured very graphically the sanctuary in heaven. Why is that so important? It's one of the reasons why we brought up the quotes we did with Kellogg at the very beginning of this presentation, because one of the things that was very much attacked in the opening um, early days of the church was the fact that the sanctuary did not really exist. That was termed the Alpha of the Apostasy by Ellen White. So we want to very carefully consider that the sanctuary is one of the most, um, one of the most uh, precious doctrines which we have, which sets us apart in actuality from all of the other faiths and denominations that we actually believe that there is a real sanctuary in heaven, that Jesus is ministering as a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary for us. That is something that I think that deserves our very close attention.
mean, you look at that, it does sort of uh, bring a sobering thought that uh, we are uh, on the cusp of eternity. And yeah, I made a mistake in showing the coming back first, but you know, in actuality, it's true. The coming back of Jesus is going to be happening first. And then, perhaps I met, perhaps, uh, what follows is the trip from earth, of course, back to heaven. Passing the earth, and you see the sun here? Notice how fast we'll pass the sun. I saw some sunspots. And then you see the Orion Nebula, you see the belt of Orion, the sword. And you see the Orion Nebula is actually in the sword of Orion. So we're moving fairly rapidly here. Breaking the speed limit. And seeing the open space in Orion, it's a ball shaped and got ready to spin around the trapezium. And really, who knows where heaven is from Orion? We don't know. It just says that God will come through that open space. We don't know what happens beyond that. But at some point, we arrive at the New Jerusalem, however it looks. Great mountain. You can see the temple, the tabernacle, and the true tabernacle in heaven, where the judgment is occurring, even now. And that the Ark of the Testament is in that tabernacle. And within the Ark of the Testament is what? An original copy of Ten Commandments that never changed. The fourth commandment is still written on the table of stone in heaven the same as it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. It can't change because it's in heaven. It's, everything in heaven is perfect. You can't erase something in heaven. So I think that uh, our point is this tabernacle in heaven, which houses the, the true um, dwelling place of God, where Jesus is ministering as our high priest, contains the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God, which were given to Moses, a copy of which were given to Moses. And because of that, we have an assurance that what we believe is as true today as it was when the Sabbath was created and blessed during the time of creation week. And that is our hope. And that is what we base our faith on. But we're not blindly basing our faith on this because we, we look at the science that supports what we talked about. And we didn't talk about a lot of science today, but we talked about it earlier this weekend. And in reviewing the evidence that we see in the polonium halos and the granites and the, and the helium retention in the zircons, it's in those evidences that we see a harmony between what science says and what the Bible says. So I don't agree that we should hang our heads and apologize to people saying, well, you know, there are evidences which we just cannot explain. Because the evidences which we do have form an Achilles heel, which basically topples the house of cards which evolution is built on. Every last bit of it. So there's nothing to apologize for, I don't think. You apologize for something that does not need apologizing for. And <clears throat> I think that, uh, that God will give us all the strength to remain true to Him if we allow Him to.
if we allow him to come into our hearts and to teach us his power and to teach us that he really does have the power to create this world, to create the stars and have us believe in him. And I think, interestingly enough, as we read in the beginning of the presentation, if we can study the stars, if we can study the astronomy, there's lessons in that for God's love for us. So that's something to think about. Perhaps if you've never looked at the stars before, you should start. It's something to do that would increase your respect and love for God. So this brings us to the end, essentially, of the presentation. But um, I hope it doesn't bring us to the end of our inquiry. Everybody, of course, is going to be leaving and we're going home. I'm going back. But we're left with the truth. The truth is written, I think, clearly in the Bible. And if we didn't understand it in the Bible, it's written again for us in the spirit of prophecy. And if we don't understand either the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, we can look out at the heavens and we can be impressed that God created all these in six literal days. Let's bow our heads for prayer as we consider these things. Father in heaven, we have gone through a lot of information about your power, the power that you have displayed in creation the power that you use to bring this world into existence. Indeed, not only this world, but the stars, Lord, the sun, the moon, and the star systems. And you have the power, Lord, if all of these things were swept away, gone, that you could call them again into existence in a moment. And we look forward to ascending to the sea of glass with you, that seven-day journey that we're going to be taking from earth to heaven. We look forward to that day when we can see firsthand the wonders of creation. And perhaps, Lord, you can explain to us more of the wonders of creation and give us new insights, Lord, which will help us to appreciate your love and care for us even more. And we thank you for that, Father, and we look forward in faith to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. To order this fascinating video, call now 1-800-467-6380. That's 1-800-467-6380. Or visit the website at www.halos.com to order by check or credit card. Again, that's www.halos.com.